All right, welcome back everybody to episode 61 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which today will be about quantum optics. As usual, we would like to have your questions. So please send us your questions to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of your screen. As always, please also note that there's a 30 second time delay between what we do here on Zoom and what you see as live on YouTube. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Ofer, who will introduce our speaker today. Um, thank you, Sebastian. And good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Peter Ravel, a uh, university professor at TU Vienna, the uh, Vienna University of Technology, where he heads the Quantum Optics and Quantum Information Group. Professor Ravel received his PhD from the University of Innsbruck and was a postdoc at ITEMP at the Harvard University and in Ikoki in Innsbruck. He joined TUVN in 2013. Peter's uh, research focuses uh, generally on uh, theoretical modeling of quantum optical phenomena, and particularly on implementations of quantum computing and quantum simulations in a plethora of uh, different physical systems in AMO, in solid states, and, and combination thereof. One of the uh, main topics he recently studies is quantum electrodynamics, QED, in waveguides, in circuits, and cavities. And today is going to tell us about the non perturbative regime of QED inside a cavity, potentially outside a cavity. So, without further ado, it is a pleasure to host Professor Rabel today. Uh, Peter, thank you for coming, and the stage is yours. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction, and specifically also for inviting me uh, to present my and giving me the opportunity to give uh, to present some of my research here at this very prestigious uh, online seminar. Okay, um, so as is, let's say the, the final goal, I think for, for this talk today would be to uh, explain to you, you know, what I mean by this phase diagram, which looks a little bit complicated over here. But I think the, the main purpose of this talk is really kind of the way how we, you know, derive at, at, at this type of, um, uh, of physics. And in the end, this, so what I will talk about can be uh, you know, summarized under this title of non perturbative QED, uh, so cavity QED, and maybe then also uh, more, more general non perturbative QED. And this is really some effort that has been going on in my group now for several years, maybe for the past five years. And a lot of, uh, you know, in the meanwhile, former PhD students and postdocs contributed to, to this work. So I really would uh, like to highlight them here right in the beginning, but also several external collaborators contributed to the things that I will talk to you about today. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, yeah, okay. So I think the, the type of field that I will uh, talk about, or the topic I will talk about today, is is kind of over the past years has been maybe termed something that I would call nowadays uh, cavity quantum materials, and the kind of the overall question that one addresses here is so given some sort of matter you know it can be atoms molecules but also solids, can we modify the properties of this matter part by coupling them to the quantized electromagnetic radiation. And this can be in principle done by, you know, shining, uh, I mean, putting, for example, these metal materials into a cavity and uh, shining a lot of light on, the, on this, this metal particle. Okay, this would be the more traditional approach, but maybe even more exciting is the question, can we actually change material properties or something like chemical reactions, ground state, thermodynamics, phase transitions, and so on, conductivity by placing materials into a cavity and only couple it to the kind of the vacuum fluctuations of the field, okay? So simply by changing the geometry, amplifying the vacuum fields, can we change material quantities? And I mean, this field is in the meanwhile quite, quite big. I mean, there are a lot of theory proposals, also some first experiments who uh, seem to see some, some effects in this direction. I mean, I will not go into very much detail here, but just refer you to this, uh, one of the most recent reviews I found on, on the web where you can find, you know, all the other of uh, uh, references, the main references in this field from there on. Okay, so this, this type of question now, can we have vacuum induced modifications of matters? Of course, sound very interesting and very, very exciting. But on the other hand, you know, we might also get, uh, ask yourself, I mean, does this all make sense? You know, 
I mean, if there's really a big effect, I mean, why don't we see it already in, in many, many experiments? And maybe also from a fundamental question. So now I can think about the, the things, if I couple now material, so many electrons, many dipoles, the single cavity mode, is it actually possible, you know, from a thermodynamical perspective to influence the, the degree of, uh, let's say, the physics of a macroscopic system by just adding a single degree of freedom, like a single cavity mode. Okay, so there, there are, on the one hand, there's a lot of exciting excitement in this field, but also uh, a lot of concerns about it. And in the end, this is actually not another very new topic. Okay, and, and the, or, uh, the origins of this field really go back um, 50 years ago and were first discussed in the context of the so-called DQ model. And just also to give a little bit now introduction, uh, so, uh, what we'll mainly talk about here is really now the, the coupling of uh, you know, matter particles with, with which we will just model as, as for example, two-level systems, two-level atoms that are coupled to a single cavity mode, to a single quantized mode. And this DQ model that is given here now simply describes as a minimal version that describes this interaction is actually quite uh, used a lot in quantum optics. So here you see the energy of the field mode, A dagger A, so it's just a harmonic oscillator. You see the collection of atoms with the frequency omega A, and these atoms are coupled by the electric field. So you have this, uh, this electric field, A plus A dagger electric field, and they couple to the polarization of the atoms, which is just expressed in these collective spin operators, collect collective SX operators. And now a feature of this model is that uh, if you look at the, at the lowest excitations in the system, then you find that, in, let's say the atoms are in resonance with this cavity, then you find a, a hybridization of the cavity and the meta excitations, and you, uh, something like uh, what people then call a quantum Rabi splitting occurs. And because all these atoms couple collectively to this cavity, you find that this Rabi splitting, so the, the hybridization between the, the, the meta modes and, and, the, and the field, scales with this square root of n. Okay, so this is the, this is the typical uh, type of splitting that you see. So now if you go to, to regular systems, uh, optical systems, or, or also in the microwave regime and so on, then you actually find that this splitting, I mean, it can be quite big, but it's still always much smaller than the, the absolute the optical frequency, for example. Okay, so we're always working in regime where we have ground state that's unaffected, and then only the excited state is split a little bit, but this is, uh, you know, much smaller than the actual frequency in the system. But you see here, you know, that there's the scaling with square root of n. So the question that you can ask is, okay, what happens if I now put more and more atoms in there? Or if I make the cavity coupling stronger, if I make mole volume smaller and increase the G? Okay, so what happens if the splitting now really becomes on the order of this cavity frequency? And this is a question that was uh, first addressed here in, in, in these two papers in, in, in the early 70s. And these people actually now took this sticky model and looked at the ground state as a function of this coupling or more precisely as the scaled coupling constant here, which I normalized uh, divided, so G squared divided by the, by the frequencies. And what you then find, if you look at the ground state, there's first of all, for small coupling, you are in a normal phase. And normal phase, okay, what's, what's, what's going on here? So that's simply all the atoms are in a ground state and th there's no photons in the cavity, no fields. And that's, of course, the, the, the thing that uh, everybody would guess yeah, that this should be the case. All the energy is gone. We are in the ground state. Okay, the excited atoms and no photons in the cavity. But what, what you find if you now increase this coupling constant, actually, there will be at, at this value of one, there will be a point where this change, the ground state changes. And at some stage, it becomes more favorable to actually put photons in the cavity. So, okay, to have a finite field expectation value. And at the same time, the atoms depolarize. Okay, so the atoms polarize in one direction, the field is in the other direction, and this uh, dipole coupling lowers the overall energy of the system. And this finite uh, or this new phase, which then people call a super radiant phase because it has some a lot of photons in there, appears as the new ground state of the system. And a way to understand this, you know, just, just simply without going down into details, but if you think, go back to the sticky model, yeah, and understand, can, how can I understand the existence of this super radiant phase, then think about uh, the atoms, you know, everything as, uh, as, as you usually assume in the ground state, so there are no photons there. But if you think now about this interaction, you see that as a term which creates a photon, uh, you know, even if you're in a ground state, you can uh, have this, this term which creates a photon, and if you then think about uh, quantum, uh, yeah, quantum mechanics, second order perturbation theory, 
you will get that, that this type of interaction will create a second order shift that show, uh, goes like g squared over omega c. And because we start in a ground state, perturbation theory will also give a minus sign here. So uh, with this basic analogy, you will see that this type of interaction will create, will generate a cavity mediated ferromagnetic coupling. Okay, so the, the, the spins all want to, the atoms, the dipoles want to, un, uh, want to align. And with this ferromagnetic interaction, if this is now big enough, you can understand that there might be a ferromagnetic phase transition in the system occurring. And that's exactly what, what then uh, is the origin of the super radiant phase that, that I just described. Okay, so this actually, everything that I told you here you know, is, is, is completely well understood. I mean, it has been re-derived and, and confirmed in, in various uh, variations thereof. But this, uh, this uh, thing, though, this discussion actually doesn't answer what actually is going on now in a system of atoms coupled with cavity, okay? And the reason what I just told you is the analysis of the DQ model. But uh, the question that still remains, is the sticky model actually a good representation of such a system where you have dipoles in the cavity? And the reason why this actually might not be uh, the, the really uh, uh, exact model is the following. You now, if, if you go back to, uh, to the origin of light matter interactions, so coupling of dipoles to electric fields is always described by this minimal coupling Hamiltonian, which you know probably familiar with. Um, so, uh, the interaction at a fundamental is given by the momentum minus the vector potential squared. And if you see, if you now take this term and multiply it out, okay, we get a momentum squared kinetic energy, then we get this cross term, which is just the interaction, that meta interaction, the, the one that I, I sort of contained in the sticky model. But there will also be a contribution from this vector potential squared, so this A squared term over here. Okay, and this is, if you go to quantum optics literature, this is usually neglected. But if you now write it out, you know, keep it and, uh, you know, replace this vector potential now by, uh, by, you know, you quantize it with a single mode. So you replace the vector potential by A plus A dagger. You find that in addition to the sticky model, you will get a term which is actually proportional to A dagger A squared. And this term appears for every atom. So there's an N scaling in front. So now you see that this is a positive contribution to my Hamiltonian. Okay, so and this is uh, for obvious reasons, it's called a squared term. And this means that if there's a field in the cavity, you will get, get, uh, get an energy penalty. Okay, so it's a positive contribution. So it will uh, cost energy to produce a field. And this, of course, now will, uh, will counteract to this lowering of the energy that you gained in this uh, super radiant phase by polarizing the atoms and, and having a finite field expectation value. Okay, at this stage you might say, okay, that's just, uh, yeah, so let's keep it. Um, then simply make this, this coupling strong and stronger to compensate for this term. But what these guys have found out, you know, pretty much after the super radiant phase transition was predicted, is that the prefactor here in front of this A squared term is not arbitrary. And independent how you, you know, how strong you make your coupling and how many atoms you, you do, this term always overcomes the energy gain that you would get by forming the super radiant phase. So, and this, and, and that's why uh, now, if you include now that it is full or study is full system, you will not find the super radiant phase transition. And that's why also this the discovery of this term, you know, has usually or this connected to this, what people then call a no go theorem. Okay, now you might say this, this, uh, this settles everything. Okay, so there's no strange instability in such a system. It also makes physical sense. But then, uh, you know, also this, this analysis here, you know, a single mode analysis, I mean, it's quite oversimplified. And actually, as soon after this came out, you know, other people claimed, okay, that there, are, there are ways to go around it. And this, this no go theorem is also not valid. But also what, what maybe uh, you also might realize, okay, so this term maybe prevents the super radiant phase. But if there's no super radiant phase, what else is there? You know, what is actually the ground state? And this is now really uh, actually something a little bit surprising, which I, I think also most people don't, don't realize. But you know, we have now roughly 70 years of quantum optics. And in this time, this, this cavity QED, you know, two-level systems, two-level atoms coupled to, to, a, to cavity mode, I mean, is the working horse of the whole field of quantum optics. Okay, every theory, every every lecture you hear on quantum op optics will actually start with this system to explain light matter interactions. And we pretty much know everything about the systems in the excited states. 
But actually, if you ask what is the ground state of this model or of, of this, this setup, then this is up to now has not been uh, determined in the literature. And again, I mean, this is of course, for if there's weak coupling, we know it. I mean, there's nothing going on. But the actually question is, what is the ground state of this type of set, setting, setting if you now start to increase the coupling more and more? Okay, and this is what I actually want, want to answer in this talk today. Good. Um, so to proceed or to get started on, on this, let's, uh, let's actually fo first focus on what I actually mean by increasing coupling strength or more precisely, you know, what I mean with, uh, in, also in the title, with this number term with QD. Okay, so what is, what is number term with what is strongly coupled in this setup? And for this, let me go back to this, this basic setup and, and think about uh, the following question. Okay, so suppose I have some, some dipoles, an elementary dipole in a coupled to a confined uh, field mode. And I ask the question, I mean, how strong can this coupling, the dipole coupling between dipole and the field mode be? And uh, strong, I mean now with respect to the overall energy scale. So the photon energy uh, given by this, this frequency omega C. Okay, so what is the ratio of dipole times the electric field per photon divided by the energy of the photon? Okay, so this is actually um, also not a very uh, difficult question to answer. So if you, uh, uh, if you already had a quantum optics uh, lecture, um, then you kind of know or if you uh, heard about quantization of the field. So let's simply write out what are these, these terms mean. Okay, so here's the h bar omega c, that's clear. The dipole moment, here I just have two charges separated by distance d, so this e times t. And then I still have this electric field per, per photon, so this, the zero point fluctuations of the electric field. And they're just given by the square root of h bar omega c over essentially the, the mode volume, so to which this mode is confined. Okay, so now I want to uh, maximize this, this number. Okay, so I now have to think about uh, which, uh, which other knobs I can tune. And obviously, I want to you know, minimize the mode volume to increase. It. So let's make the mode volume as small as possible. And if I have a certain you know, uh, photon with a frequency uh, omega c, then essentially I can create a cavity, which is, is kind of uh, roughly the, 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 the wavelength cube large, which of course also means that my cavity frequency, you know, if I make my volume smaller, cavity frequency goes up like one over lambda. But let's let's put this in, okay, and replace the volume by lambda cube and uh, the omega c also by lambda. So with this, I then have an, an an upper bound for this ratio, which now only depends on the dipole moment, essentially over the the cavity uh, over the wavelength. So now the question is, how big can I make my dipole? So very often, okay, you have here an atom, so this dipole moment is fixed. But let's be completely general, okay? Suppose I can uh, find uh, any system, or what is the, the best system? Uh, uh, let's say, what is the maximum dipole moment I can make? Um, and in this case, you know, in principle, I can make my dipole as big as possible, but in the end of the day, it still has to fit into this cavity. Okay, so let's take the, the maximum dipole that fits into the cavity. So I said D is approximate lambda, and then also this parameter cancels out, and I'm left with a number of, of fundamental constants. And if you then uh, also remember some uh, uh, yeah, introductory course in quantum optics or quantum, uh, uh, quantum physics in general, you might realize that this combination is nothing else but the fine structure constant. Okay, so this means to sum up, so we have the, uh, the physics, okay, so or let's say this, this basic estimate means that the coupling over relative to the, to the cavity, the photon energy, is always bounded by this fine structure constant. And to some extent, of course, it makes sense. You know, if, if you think about electro, quantum electrodynamics, that's the only what, essential dimensionless parameter that it conforms, so it, it makes sense that it appears. But in the other, other hand, it's, it's not also a little bit surprising because here we have, you know, we have confined fields, we can have arbitrary dipole moments, and still independent of what we do, this ratio shows up, okay? There's nothing uh, pretty much we can do with just making the system smaller or, or playing around with the dipole or the molecule that we use. And this is, uh, I think, now also an important uh, uh, thing that I want to emphasize here. Okay, so by even making the, the, the cavity as small as possible, okay, you will increase the coupling quite a bit compared to a big cavity, but still you never get out of the regime where this interaction is actually just a small perturbation. 
So we still be left with this, this type of, uh, of uh, the general structure that we have. So we have atoms, molecules that are coupled by electrostatic forces. And then on top of it, we couple it to the quantized field, but this will always be a small perturbation. Okay, so this seems like a pretty, uh, more or less the end of, of, of all these questions that are raised in, in the beginning. And it's, it's a quite general proof as we've seen in this derivation, but it actually I made, uh, I made a crucial approximation or an important approximation in this derivation. And to see this, let me now redo this derivation, but let's say with what I would call engineered photons. Okay, so suppose I have a way to produce photons, electromagnetic excitations, where it can change the ratio between the electric and the, and, and, and the magnetic field components. And this uh, change in, in this ratio is simply the impedance of this mode. Okay, so if you think about uh, uh, electromagnetic circuits is something that's called impedance. So if I have this more general situation, I can do this, this, this estimate again, and I find again, I get a bound, which is proportional to this fine structure constant. Okay, it's still electromagnetism by the uh, additional prefactors. Okay, so one thing, of course, I can also increase the charge of this dipole, okay, make it bigger in principle. So this, this charge enters here squared. But also this impedance, so the properties of this electromagnetic mo mode enter with a, a impedance over the vacuum imp imp impedance value. Okay, so suppose I now go to uh, uh, you know, some, some structure, like for example, plasmonic structures, this, this ratio actually be, can be quite enhanced. Okay, it's no longer given by, by the wavelength itself, but actually by the, the, by the ratio of, the, of this nanostructure that, that I fabricated. And more generally, if I go to lower frequencies to gigahertz regime, I can fabricate uh, LC circuits where this L and the C are not completely arbitrary, but I can really engineer now circuits using either superconductors, uh, superinductors, so superconducting uh, devices to increase this L, but also with geometric inductors, people have realized circuits by this set can be, you know, maybe a factor, roughly a factor 100 larger than the vacuum value. And this can actually now be used to compensate the small value of the fine structure constant. And in this way, at least in principle, we can now en engineer or have systems where dipoles are coupled to electric magnetic waves with a coupling constant that can be increased you know, up to certain values or at least in the order, uh, order one or even above. Okay, so uh, again, this is not something that comes very natural. But in principle, in this type of engineered artificial systems, so creating these this LC circuits or these artificial modes, or quite general, going to a superconducting circuits where you have an uh, analogy between atoms. So you have artificial atoms coupled to artificial fields. You can really reach a condition where we do now electro uh, quantum electrodynamics uh, and, and the, the system now behaves as if we would have a fine structure constant that becomes of order unity. And at this stage, you know, at least within this framework, quantum electrodynamics is no longer a perturbative theory, but becomes non-perturbative. And this is what I mean with this word here. Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, um, uh, okay, the, the first uh, meaning about, about, about this term here. Now it's of course the question, what happens in this regime? And as I, uh, already mentioned in, in, in the beginning, you know, uh, uh, a lot of this, uh, this, uh, this whole field, you know, was always kind of uh, plagued by, the, by, this, uh, by, this, by this question about what is actually the, the right Hamiltonian. You know, one Hamiltonian shows this phase transition, another one that, that doesn't show it. So first of all, we have to ask the question of what is actually the model to describe this, this parameter regime. And here, I just uh, want to remember, uh, remind you, you know, so, if we have a system of charges coupled to electromagnetic fields, I mean, we would all agree that, that there is this minimal coupling Hamiltonian that we can write down and this describes the system. Okay, so everybody kind of agrees on, on, on this form up here. But this is usually far too complicated to, to be treated. And if you now go up and up a quantum optics books, you know, we, uh, we will actually take this Hamiltonian and go through a lot of uh, approximations and end up with an effective James Cummings type uh, Hamiltonian which you can then solve and, 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 and do physics with it. And this is all, uh, all these approximations are, are, are very fine as long as this coupling is G is small. So now what, what people will tell you if this G is now, uh, now bigger than or comparable to these this frequencies, then of course these approximations uh, might break, break down. In particular, there's this rotating wave approximation. 
So you don't have no longer energy conserving processes because this G is so big. So this rotating wave approximation probably breaks down. But uh, what is often forgotten in, in this whole discussion is that this is, I mean, this, this is true, this approximation breaks down, but also all the other approximations can, uh, can break down and actually they will break down if you go in this coupling regime. And in principle now, okay, so the, this whole der derivation, I mean, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's really its, it's uh, own seminar or even two seminars by, by its own, but I still would like to, uh, to highlight, I think, kind of one aspect about how to going from this full uh, Hamiltonian to these effective models, which I think is is quite uh, illustrative, illustrative, why you know, and also shows why things can go wrong in this derivation. Okay, so to do so, let's let's consider a simple system. Okay, we have dipoles and a cavity. Uh, we treat them all as kind of one-dimensional charges in some double well potential. So why a double well potential? Because this allows me to define two of the lowest levels. Uh, so they are energetically separated from all the rest. So I can do a two level approximation. Okay, so that, that, that's what we usually want to do. So there are two uh, lowest levels and they're coupled now, these dipoles are now coupled to this field in this mode. And this kind of minimal coupling Hamiltonian from before would now then read simply now the, the momentum minus the vector potential, which is just the A plus A dagger. We have the, this uh, confining potential here. We have the cavity mode. And in principle, there would also be direct static electric dipole-dipole uh, interactions. But in the following, you know, to keep the discussion simple, we will neglect it and they are not, uh, not important for the following arguments. Okay, so this would be kind of now a minimal type of model. And again, it's you know, up to some simplifications, this is still correct. So what would you now do to derive a cavity QED Hamiltonian? So essentially to do this two level approximation. So to do this, we, we take this Hamiltonian and first of all, we multiply out this, this square up here. Okay, it's P minus it's QA squared. And okay, so what, what do we get? Okay, we first take the first P square term, that's the kinetic energy, we combine it to potential. So that's the Hamiltonian of the dipoles. Okay, so the motion of the meta part. So then we get this, square, uh, this cross term. So we have the P coupled to the vector potential. So that's the coupling term. And then, as I already mentioned in, 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 the, in the very beginning, because we have this A and we have the square of it, we have this additional A squared term. Okay, but this contains now only cavity operators. Okay, so this, this is uh, all A and A daggers here. So at this stage, everything uh, you know, is, is still exact. We haven't done anything. But now we make a two level approximation. So we take this Hamiltonian, we diagonalize it, we take the lowest two states and write it as a sigma C operator. Then uh, projected on these two states, you know, this, this momentum operator, they will couple these two states and, and therefore cause transitions. So that's why we replace it in this two level approximation. We replace it by sigma x operator that is then coupled to a dagger a. So this is my coupling Hamiltonian. And finally, we're left with this, uh, this, this, uh, this Hamiltonian here for the cavity, which has this, this, this additional a plus a dagger square term. But what you realize, you know, so the first part is a harmonic oscillator. And this is just an x squared term, okay? A plus a dagger squared. So this whole thing is still a harmonic oscillator. So the only thing that changes that to this correction term, it will have a slightly different frequency. So by doing this approximation again, so we have uh, replaced here the dipoles by two level systems, the two level systems coupled to the cavity mode. And due to this a squared correction, we get a, a renormalized cavity frequency here. Okay, so with this, uh, I essentially just, just shown you that, that we have arrived, you know, for this uh, whole derivation, we have actually arrived at the Dickey model that I pointed out in the, in the very beginning. Okay, so we have the cavity, the, the dipoles, and this A plus A dagger that couples to the polarization. So the only thing that is now, now different, you know, this is this tilde here, is this renormalized cavity frequency. And now at this stage, I can ask myself, you know, given this Hamiltonian, do I actually reach the super radiant phase transition that I talked about? So this two super radiant phase transition occurs if this coupling parameter here reaches one. And, but now because I have this renormalized cavity frequency, I also have to put this renormalized cavity frequency here in this parameter. So now you can take this ratio and actually go back to the, to the previous slide and, and put in the definition of all these parameters here. And you now it's, it's, I will not go in, into all the details here. But what you find is that uh, after some rearrangement, you can write this ratio here 
as, as the product of two terms, where, I mean, first looking, I don't know, looking at the first terms, you find something that is given by this cavity frequency plus, uh, so this, this coupling over the cavity frequency, and, but you get from this correction term, you get a cavity frequency squared plus coupling squared. So you see, if I now increase the coupling or the number of atoms, this ratio actually can never be bigger than one. Okay, so, and this is exact, exactly this renormalization effect, the, the change in this cavity frequency. If I increase the coupling, I also increase the cavity frequency, and that's why this is bounded. Okay, that's maybe not so, uh, so worrying. Let's, let's look at the other term. Here's the matrix element. So let's simply take a, a system where this matrix element is now super big. But here comes uh, there's something that, that uh, we come across you know, in physics very often. This is something that's called a sum rule. And the sum rule simply tells me that if I have a particle in arbitrary potential, and I look at the matrix element between the, the P operator between the lowest two level, then this matrix element is bounded actually by the matrix element of a harmonic, harmonic oscillator. Okay, so this is a fundamental bound, independent of what you do with the parameter, you will always find this constraint. And this, of course, now also means that the second uh, term is bounded by one, and overall, this parameter will always be smaller than one, independent of what you do. And this is exactly this no-go theorem, which, which I pointed out in, in the beginning. Okay, and this is now, um, yeah, uh, again, everything here is completely general, and, and uh, we say, okay, now, now we know it for, for sure. But um, what actually people, I mean, people derived this many, many times, but um, what I think nobody ever, uh, ever did was to check if this all true, okay? So let me simply take my simple model again. Let's go to one particle. This is something I can, can solve very easily on the computer. So I take my particle and its potential. I take all, uh, all values, uh, all levels into account. Don't do any approximation. And uh, on the other hand, I make, uh, make this, this approximation, I make this Rabi, uh, Rabi model with this normalized frequency. And then I can simply compare the prediction of these two cases. And what you see, you know, this Rabi model is effective two-level model. I mean, produces this level splitting as we expect and, and which we, uh, you know, do, do, do uh, many times. But then you find if you go to coupling strength that are all the one or even bigger, the two, the full model and this effective two-level model don't agree at all. Okay, and at this stage you might, might say, okay, I, I did a two-level approximation. I have here a quite large coupling. And of course, if I have a large coupling, then the two-level approximation is not valid anymore. But what I have not shown you here is that actually for this example that I've shown here, I've chosen a, a particular showcase for this potential where the second or the transition to the third level is a hundred times larger than the level splitting between the lowest two levels. Okay, so again, we have now a two level system with a frequency that is, let's say order one. We have a cavity with a frequency that's of order one. And we have a coupling that's of order one. And then the next level is a factor of hundred uh, away. Okay, so there is no way that, that there is, uh, this is just in our, the, the two-level approximation is, is no longer fully valid. So something really serious is going on in, in this, this way that we just did here. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's really, I think, in the beginning, completely, completely surprising, and also when we first came across this, this observation. But if you think about it, you can actually understand it. And the problem here really is that, that the interaction that you have, you know, is, is the vector potential couples to the P operator. And the, the matrix elements of these momentum operators, they scale with the difference in frequency between two levels. So this means if you couple a level to, a high, uh, to another high level uh, system, uh, state that is very high up there, then also, I mean, there's a big energy difference, but also the matrix elements scale proportional to it. So you cannot simply eliminate a state because it's high in energy, because it's all, also, if it's high in energy, it's also strongly coupled. Okay, so this means that in, in this regime, it's simply not possible to do a two-level approximation. And, um, okay, so then the question is, what, what do we do about it? And uh, so either, okay, we have to deal with the fact that we have to include all the, all the levels, or the other thing is that helps us here is to do gauge transformations. 
So in electrodynamics, you know, you're not constrained to have a certain vector potential. You can always transform it. You do this, uh, this uh, gauge transformation, which leaves the, the physics invariant. Invariant, and here we can essentially do a, a, a change to a dipole gauge, which essentially means that we transform away the vector potential at the position of the dipoles. Okay, so that that would be the, the rough idea here. Um, I mean, formally, you do this in, in in quantum physics. You do gauge transformation in terms of unitary transformations. So essentially, we do a unitary transformation on my on our Hamiltonian with this particular u. So maybe just to, to, to briefly, I mean, without going into details, but just roughly to understand what's going on. So actually, yeah, if I apply this unitary transformation to my dipole part of the Hamiltonian, then I simply transform away this A, and this means I'm left with a bare, uh, the bare Hamiltonian of the dipole. But of course, I somehow conserve uh, the difficulty. So if I now transform my, my cavity Hamiltonian, I shift all the cavity operators by this uh, by a term proportional to the xi. Okay, so uh, now I have here a much more complicated term, but let's let's again multiply this out and square. I take the first term that reproduces my cavity. I get this cross term, so x couples to a and, and a dagger. That's now my coupling, and very similar to the to the previous case. I get when I square out this, this, uh, this, these two terms, I get something that's proportional to the, to the polarizations, to the dipole moment squared. Okay, so and this is now an analogy to, to this A squared term. This is now called the, the P squared term. So at this stage, you might think, okay, we have, we have done nothing. You know, we just shifted the problem from, from, from the cavity to the dipoles. Um, and again, we have to take this and, and put a renormalized uh, dipole potential over here. But let's simply uh, see what's happening. Okay, so I, I do this procedure. I derive now this, again, the same Rabi type model. So it looks the same as before, but with now, instead of a normalized cavity frequency, we have a normalized dipole frequency. I take again the same system as we had before, the same, same, same potential. And we see in this case, it is indeed possible to derive this model to do a two level approximation. And the prediction of this Rabi model, you know, agree with the exact simulation you know, all the way to very large interaction, interaction strength. So this means you know, that this, there is actually no fundamental limit on the coupling strength. So this local theorem that we've seen before is really just an artifact of, of this, this consequent that we cannot do a double approximation in this Coulomb gauge. And it is you know, just to, to show, you, show you again, and, and this, yeah, I like to call this now gauge non invariance. So, of course, on, on a fundamental level, on, on an on exact level, uh, also cavity QD is gauge invariance. It can work in every gauge you want to do. But if you make approximation, and that's the important message, uh, so approximations like the two level approximations only work in a specific gauge. And this you have to keep in mind before you go on and derive, uh, derive your models or do any other physics with it. Okay, so then uh, as, a, as a last step, okay, let me um, now, okay, this, this calculation maybe just okay, has just uh, shown that we need to work in this dipole gauge. And again, let me, let me write down now this, this full Hamiltonian that we get in this dipole gauge. Again, dipoles, the coupling, and this P square term. And now, okay, we can do a two level approximation. So it essentially means that this X, the extension, the dipole uh, operator here, we replace by a sigma C operator. So what we end up with is this kind of uh, Dickey model of, that we get over here. And from now from this interaction, okay, so, and this is something I cannot put in a renormalized cavity pre, uh, 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 potential, dipole potential, because this is now really a term where different dipoles coupled to each other so I get this, this, uh, this new p square term contribution. And if I do a, a right uh, choice of all these parameters, I find that the prefactor here is just given by the coupling squared over omega c. OK, and this brings me now to, the, uh, to this uh, final, final point that I wanted to make here. OK, so doing this derivation, and of course, there are several details that I, that I skipped here. But at the end of the day, if I would like to describe the system at arbitrary coupling strength, I have to, uh, so I can write down this Dickey model that we had before. Okay, so we almost got it right, but I have to add this additional p square contribution here, which is this collective 
uh, dipole operator squared. And just to, uh, to mention, okay, I, uh, you know, I did this for this very simple system, but in the end of the day, you know, you can also more generally show that independent of, of which type of implementation, you can go to circuit QED, you can, can work with, with optical frequencies or, or microwave frequencies, you will always end up with this minimal model to describe this QED QED system. Okay, and this is, um, yeah, maybe it took uh, a little bit longer, or let me just say this, this very last point. I mean, of course, one, one thing which I said in the very beginning, you know, I neglected the st static double double interactions. So for some of these, these systems, you need to introduce it to be more, more precise, but it's actually something that is, let's say, on a conceptual level, not really important for the next stuff I would like to discuss. So, um, yeah, so this is kind of the, already the, the kind of the first part. I mean, just deriving at this cavity QED Hamiltonian and uh, yeah, I just want to ask at this stage if there are uh, any questions or something that we should already discuss at, at this stage. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll go um, by the order um, of the talk and uh, we have a few questions. Actually, some of them you eventually answered. Uh, so for example, um, uh, one of the question was if, whether you can increase the coupling using sub wavelength confinement um or a plasmonic structure which mm -hmm. you showed you can um so in this context um uh, do you have an intuitive picture uh for the mapping uh, uh from the cavity system to the superconducting circuit um so what, what what is actually done in uh, uh in the superconducting circuit that kind of solves the uh the problem of strong coupling so um um Okay, so what is the intuitive? I, th I think to, to to some extent it, it is this uh, this um, the, the the thing. Okay, so that that you simply in, in to think about this LC circuit, you know the uh, the, the the wavelength. So the, the the mode volume to which you can find the electric field is is decoupled from from the from from the uh, from the wavelength or the frequency of the system. So. Um, it's, I mean, I, I think, so in, in the circuit, um, circuit language, if you're really an inductor and a capacitor, so I think in, the, in this limit, everything becomes very, very simple. And it can really show that then this coupling constant is, is limited by this, by this impedance. But um, in, at least in, in, in my, how I think about it, um, you know, this, this impedance in turn is, is somehow related how, yeah, how strongly you can confine uh, the mode compared, uh, you know, with respect to the, to the frequency or the, the, the free space wavelength. And, you know, in, in, let's say maybe instead of this impedance, you can think about the, uh, the dielectric constant epsilon that, that would, so this would be equivalent. So if you would have a mode in a, in a, in a medium with a high dielectric constant, then also the, the, the vol mode volume or the, um, would would be would be reduced. So I think that that's that's also an analogy to, un to understand it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. Um, we have a question from uh, Ranjit Singh, uh, who asks: uh, Do you use any recipes or guidelines to derive the interaction Hamiltonian? Do you have any checks or controls, such as commutation relations, to verify the correctness of the Hamiltonian you obtain? So, I mean, okay, so we don't do commutation relations and so on. Um, let's say what I can, can say, and maybe here go back to this, um, to this type of, uh, of systems. So, so what we do, I mean, it's, it's of course still some, some simplification, but, but here we, I mean, we actually compare the, the, full, uh, the full model. Okay, so here there's no approximation on the dipole component. That's really a particle moving in, in the potential. We take this, and then we compare it with the approximate model where we do a two-level approximation and we check uh, all the time, you know, that this is uh, a valid approximation. We also do other checks where, for example, include uh, not only one mode, we include two or three modes. I mean, at some stage, it's not longer possible to simulate these systems, but also uh, we check that, you know, if you're in a situation where there's one mode and all the other modes are much higher in energy, then we still get uh, this effective model is still a good approximation. Okay, so you can see 
you know, here you see that's a rather extreme example where this double well potential, you know, the energy separation is really extreme, but we, we go to more realistic systems, uh, to superconducting circuits that are, that are, you know, where we know the parameters, where you can go to experiments and take the parameters. We take the full model and see that at least for small systems, for a single dipole, for two dipoles, this effective model is still very good. You know, it might not be perfect, but very good. Yeah. So really, really a lot of it in the, in the process of deriving this, this Hamiltonian, you know, it was really all about checking all the approximation that we made to make sure that we are confident that this gives the right physics. Um, uh, Peter, what about higher order uh, cavity modes like in the uh, very strong coupling regime? Um, why can you make the assumption of a single mode cavity? Yeah, so this is maybe, um, again, if we go to this, this type of examples, so essentially all the, the systems are, you know, go back to this LC circuit. So or let, let's say you're, you're maybe right, if I go to something like, like KVD, okay, so then you have equal mode spacing. If you're strongly coupled to the first mode, you're also strongly coupled to the second mode, okay? So in this case, um, you, you cannot do this approximation, but also in this mode, in, then you have a free, uh, free spectrum, um, then we cannot reach this ultra strong coupling regime. So that's, that's why we are anyway interested in this uh, LC circuit. And there you have a lumped element resonator. And then you can design, if you design it in, in a few gigahertz regime, if you couple it to charge qubits, superconducting qubits or so, then you can make sure that the next higher mode is maybe a factor of, of, of 20 or maybe even 100 higher. Yeah. So you need really the separation, okay? It doesn't make sense, you know, if the next mode is just a factor three higher, you, this will not be a good model. But uh, if you go to this LC circuits, to these engineered modes, uh, so that's why I also emphasize and always work on the systems because in this set of setup, you can uh, ensure that this is fulfilled. So, but, and then what about a real cavities? Um, then it would uh, always be an issue? Yeah, but, but then let's say if I go to back to this real cavity, then I have uh, kind of shown you, shown you before that in principle, the coupling to, the sing to even a single mode will be kind of small. You know, at, at least uh, it cannot reach more unity. Mm -hmm. So that's why in this context, it's maybe then you don't even have to deal with this type of questions, but because you're anyway always in the in, in this regime. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I, actually, okay. we have questions about um, um, multiple dipoles, multiple atoms, which I think maybe we should keep to the end. Um, so maybe at this point, only one uh, thing that remains: um, what then is the ground state? in the strong coupling uh, constant, is there a uh, no-go theorem? And yeah, so, so this is, is not a, in the case or is, is there not? This is not a question which, uh, yeah, I hope I still have. <laughs> I think I will run a little bit out of time, uh, but yeah, so this, this I, I still try to answer now in the next slide, so. All right, yeah. all right, so yeah. please. Yeah, okay, so at this stage, okay, we have derived at this model, and now the question is, okay, do we have a, a superated phase transition? And let's say the first thing that we can do is you now do the same thing as, as we did in the beginning. Okay, so we take this model, there's this interaction, and let's treat it in perturbation theory. Okay, so uh, at least to get a rough idea. And then, uh, I mean, this term is the same as before in the Dickey model. Okay, so we again get this, this minus g squared over omega c as x squared, so this ferroelectric interaction. But now we see, you know, we just have this other, this p squared term in the Hamiltonian. So these two contributions exactly cancel. Okay, so this means at this stage, from this naive argument, I mean, we, we, don't, ex uh, we don't have an instability. There's nothing that, that goes negative, that, that uh, favors a, a line state, but also we don't have any cavity mediated uh, interaction at all. Okay, so this type of picture does not allow us to answer the question, what is the ground state? Okay, so to, uh, to deal with this uh, system, actually, let me uh, try to do a little bit, first of all, hand-waving type of explanations and, and see uh, two main effects that are important. And for this, first of all, uh, let's have a, a dipole. Um, uh, let's say, I think of the dipole in free space, okay? And, and so we align now the dipole. This means if the dipole is aligned in a certain direction, it's actually an eigenstate of the sigma x operator. Okay, x is, uh, sigma x is, is the dipole direction, that's the polarization. So we have a dipole aligned in this direction, it's the eigenstate of the sigma x operator, 
in the other direction, it's minus state, this eigenstate. Um, and of course, if you have now just a free oscillation of the dipole, the dipole will oscillate between these two states, meaning simply it will oscillate between these two configurations if nothing else is going on. Okay, so if you now put this in a cavity, and again, let me uh, use the circuit analogy because it's easier to explain. Then, of course, we have this line dipole and associated with it an electric field or equivalently some induced charges, uh, some uh, surface charges on this capacitor plates. Okay, so the state that we have now is, is this uh, uh, dipole state with a, a charge that is now the minus Q. And the other configuration is the same, but now the, the charge you know, has changed from minus to plus. So what this means, you know, if, if the dipole now oscillates inside this cavity, what it actually has to do, it has to turn itself, but also the charges have to flow through this inductor to the other side, okay, or from here on, on the other side. So you see that if, if this dipole now wants to move, it actually has to drag around these charges and you know it's, it's something like it becomes more heavy, or it's 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 it, it will you can ex expect that the oscillation frequency will decrease because the dipole has to carry around all the all other charges or other electric field configurations in the systems. And this is actually a first important effect that, that matters. So if we now take just these these two uh, configurations and have these three Hamiltonians, so if the, the the dipole wants to oscillate from one uh, space to the other, essentially we have this oscillation frequency. But we also have these two distinct charge configurations. Okay, these are macroscopically distinct. So there will be an overlap between these two cavity states that is, that is, uh, that is small. And how small is, is it? If we now do the math, you see that this uh, frequency is actually suppressed proportional to this coupling constant. So that's why this will not be a, a big, so in regular systems, this, this is negligible, okay, because this coupling constant is much smaller than, than the cavity frequency. So you don't care about this usually. But in this ultra strong coupling regime, you see once this G is of order omega C, this can become a really strong effect. Okay, so this is this type of uh, polarization or polaron physics, where we have the, 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 the particles, the dipoles here coupled strongly to some uh, bosonic environment. And if the particle now tunnels between two configurations, it has to drag this bosonic environment along. And the overlap between these two states then determines uh, an effective or reduced uh, frequency. Okay, so this is, this is one important effect that, that, that now happens, but at this stage, it's still kind of a single particle effect. Okay, we reduce the frequency, but otherwise nothing really changes. Okay, we could have started from a smaller frequency in the beginning. But there's actually another process that is important here, and that is the following. Okay, so let's take now kind of these two dipoles. Then one of them can, again, flip or try to oscillate, to other configuration, but let's say only virtually. Okay, you change this, but you don't change the charge configuration. So this means electrostatically, this is a, a this is a higher energy state, so you cannot live there forever. But then you can do uh, you know undo it again and have here just some second order process to some higher energy virtual state. So in this configuration, okay, uh, the, the the cavity mode, the charge configuration doesn't change. But you see at this stage, okay, nothing, nothing, nothing has happened. Okay, so it's, it's maybe not, not really important. But you can also start from a different configuration. So if you start from this configuration, okay, so you change, uh, let's say first uh, this guy, but then you change the other, other guy back. Okay, so this, uh, the, the final uh, state is exactly the same as the chain charges. In this case, it's just zero, uh, but what happened is that the state of the two dipoles has flipped. So via this process, again, this doesn't involve the cavity at all or only by virtual excitation, so it's not exponentially suppressed. Um, but via this process, we can actually induce some interaction. And now of, of this, okay, so this, uh, here I tried to illustrate this process. If you have now many dipoles and, and you know there are a lot of these processes going on, so many combinations. So at this stage, you have to go back to the pen and paper and, and do the math. So we take an arbitrary type of configuration of dipoles. We look at these virtual processes. Again, they don't change the cavity mode, so they are not exponentially suppressed. Uh, but they have a little, you know, this, this energy de denominator, okay? so that the so the stronger the coupling is, the higher this excitate, the energy of this middle state is. So, and in the end, it turns out that this, all these processes can be uh, simplified in a very compact form. 
And uh, the, the, the main thing I want to highlight here is actually the, the, this plus sign up front and this SX squared operator. So again, this SX is the polarization. And this uh, polarization squared means, and together with this plus sign, is that the high polarization of the system has a high energy. So uh, to minimize this interaction term, actually the system wants to minimize the, the, the polarization. And that's why, as you know, in contrast to this uh, thicker model type physics that we had in the beginning, this type of process induces an anti electric coupling. Okay, so this is now really also now a many body effect. So here the, the, uh, the types really talk to each other. And now, uh, I mean, doing this now more systematically, okay, you can also mathematically derive it. We, we find that really now in this strong coupling limit, we can actually write down an effective Hamiltonian for, for this whole system, which is on one hand contains this suppression of the frequency. So this, this, uh, this renom mass renormalization effect, frequency renormalization effect, this exponential suppression, but also this anti ferroelectric interaction, this collective spin operators. And here, what I have just done is, is now I know just take this, this the, the original Hamiltonian for four particles to an exact diagonalization. So you see in the beginning, you have this the, the regular splitting, the, the Rabi splitting that, that you're familiar with. Then there's some region where you know you have no idea what's, what's going on, a lot of spaghetti is going uh, over here. But then if you go to even larger interactions, you see again some structure in the system. And if you now uh, zoom into, into the states, you can actually really order all these states and they are just ordered according to, to, the, to the quantum numbers, the MX quantum numbers given by, by this last term over here. Okay, so we can now really understand it. And this now also means that we understand what is, what is the ground state. And the ground state of the system is now something, uh, as, as I pointed out, we have this anti ferroelectric interaction so that the typos, they want to anti-align. But at the same time, and that's maybe, you know, I didn't... Uh, emphasize this too much. Um, the, the system also wants to maximize the total angular momentum. So this means out of all possible anti-aligned states, anti parametric states, the system chooses the one where all of these combinations are in an equal superposition. So that, that's the most, most collective state. And if you think about this state on a Bloch sphere, you actually find, you know, this is, again, this, this state minimizes the SX component and uh, it does so by kind of really bending around the, you know, it's not the equator, it's, it's the, it's the uh, tilted, rotated equator here. So uh, all the states which, uh, which are polarized, which minimize the SX component. And now you can also understand it. So it's anti ferroelectric but also at the same time, uh, I mean, these, these, these thicker states are really highly entangled states. So it's a really highly non-trivial state that comes out here as a ground state. And okay, so once, uh, so this is about the, the dipole configuration. Maybe let's also now look, um, go back to this <coughs> original plot uh, um, and look at the, the field configuration. So uh, again, let, let's plot actually the, the ground state photon number, A dagger A, uh, as a function of this coupling strength. Uh, again, so for, for reference, I plotted here the, the prediction of the Dickey model. So this would be again this, this phase transition. And at this, this point, you know, uh, you know, the system would just explode. So there will be a lot of photons in the system. But we see now that the actual model, I mean, there is some hybridization going on, but the photon number, you know, is, is, is much smaller. Uh, you can go and increase the coupling again. I mean, there, there will, so, you know, there, there are photons in the ground state and this simply because that, I mean, the dipoles are strongly coupled to the photons. Okay, so they will really form hybridized excitation and that's why, uh, why it grows here. Now at this stage, you see, you know, we have already quite, quite a large coupling over here, but let's go even, even larger. And then you see something very surprising happening. Okay, so I mean, we have here this hybridization, systems are strongly coupled, but suddenly the photon number goes down again if we go to very large interactions. And again, this is uh, very surprising. We just look, look at this curve, but I mean, with knowledge that we have developed now in, in the previous slide, we can understand it in this form. Namely that the dipoles here in this regime, they form this anti-aligned state. So they are anti-aligned and therefore they also cannot couple the cavity. So they, 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 they anti-align and thereby they decouple and therefore also the cavity photons relax uh, back in, 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 the, in, in the ground state. And that's why this, this phase over here, you know, instead of the sub, uh, super radiant phase where you have a lot of photons in the cavity, 
This is actually a collective subradiant phase that appears here now as the new ground state in this really, I've, you know, I emphasize this really strong coupling, a very strong coupling machine. And just to make also make uh, make uh, emphasize this, this point, okay? So uh, introduced in the very beginning, this this, this effective fine structure constant, and you actually see uh, if you plot here this alpha effective equal one, you really see that this is actually the point where the physics changes. So also that that creates this 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 connection, uh, so that that this parameter this uh, non perturbative regime is actually the, the regime where things now drastically change and and are completely different to what has been predicted by the Dickey model. And again, maybe this is a, a just a, a, to summarize uh, to highlight these these differences. Yeah, so that that really kind of this intuition that we got from from quantum optics, working with a lot with Dickey and Rabi models. Uh, we have this type of phase transition, this instability in the ground state, this polarized ground state. We have this exponential decay of all, all, all the energy levels. And what actually happens now in, in this type of systems is completely different. We have these decoupling effects. We have a, a lot more structure in, in the excited state uh, spectrum. And yeah, and this is just to highlight this effect. Okay, um, at this stage, um, we, yeah, um, uh, I think now come, come to the final point, okay. Um, I've, I've told you now the, I mean, the, the basic type of physics that, that's going on in such a system uh, for, let's say, for, for a cavity uh, and, 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 and system, let's say, that, that actually there were no other interactions at all. Okay, we have just dipoles coupled to a cavity mode. Now, this is maybe not very realistic because, you know, as soon as you have some dipoles, that they will always, even if the interactions are screened in the system, there will always be some coupling. So the final point we then did is, is in order to look at what actually happens now for the ground state, if we have this collective coupling to cavity, but also we have realistic short range dipole dipole interactions included. Now at this stage, of course, the problem is we have now many spins, short range interactions, long range interactions, uh, large couplings. So this is nothing uh, I can, can solve anymore analytically or even on, on my computer. And here I have to give uh, now a lot of credit to, to Michael Schuler, who was postdoc in my group for, for two years. And he knows about exact diagonalization. So he simply took now this Hamiltonian, uh, took 30, 30 spins, and just simulated the exact ground state uh, and, and looked at the phase diagram. And this is then in the end and what, what you get. And, and maybe because we're running a little bit out of time, maybe just the, 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 main, the main features that you see here. So again, this is now. Um, the, the ground state of this cavity QED system as a function of this coupling strength. And here, uh, using this nearest neighbor dipole dipole interaction as a tunable parameter, okay, having either negative interactions or positive interactions. And these are now the phases. So if you start here at G equals zero, that's okay, that's just uh, dipoles interact interacting with each other. So that's a transverse Ising model. So here everything is known. We have a ferroelectric phase for negative interactions. We have an anti-ferro-nil uh, nil, uh, anti phase for positive interaction. In between, we have a paraelectric phase. Okay, so that, that's, that's what's happened here. Now, if you switch on the, uh, the coupling, okay, then the photons come into play. And if we would now look at this point here and look at the system, you find that it has a polarization. It, no, it has a finite polarization and the finite field expectation value. So this is, looks exactly like the super radiant phase I told in the very beginning, okay? And in principle, you can be allowed to, to call it super radiant phase, but here one has to keep in mind, you know, that the origin of this polarization is simply this, uh, this attractive nearest neighbor interactions, okay? They cause this polarization. And once you have a polarization, you naturally also have a field associated with it. That's why the field expectation value is also non-zero. So, so this is important to keep in mind, you know, if you have a, such a system, it's in principle natural as soon as you have uh, uh, already negative dipole dipole interaction in the system, you can have some, something that you can call superated phase, but it's more honest to actually talk about this as a ferroelectric phase. Okay, so then you increase the coupling and actually you see that there's maybe not a lot happening, but still you see that, for example, the phase boundary between the paraelectric and the ferroelectric or also the, the Antiferroelectric phase, it depends on, on the coupling constant. Okay, so we, we have an influence, the cavity has an influence on this, this phase transition uh, physics that's going on. 
But then uh, let, let's say, I mean, so now the, these phases, they are, they are modulated, but in addition that we have is now, so if you look now at, at systems where they are weakly interacting, okay? So there's almost no interaction. We find this red region over here. And this is now, if you look at these expectation values, okay, you have no photons, you have no ferroelectric expectation value, you have no staggered, no, so need, no uh, anti-ferroelectric expectation value. So there's no uh, kind of order parameter in the system. But, and this looks now really, really strange and new, but actually we can understand it now with this type of physics that I introduced before. So this state, and now it has no, um, no field expectation value because all the, all the typos are anti-aligned, but it also doesn't have this ordering from, the, from this uh, new uh, anti-ferromagnetic phase because it's this collective superposition. So it's really kind of a new state that doesn't exist in regular, in regular solids or, or spin systems. And also just to, to emphasize very briefly, you now you can really now go through this, 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 uh, this uh, make a cut here or, or here, and you really find that these two states, you know, even if they share some properties, so this is now really a unique phase, which is uh, separated from all the other regimes by this rather sharp phase transitions. Okay, so this is actually the, actually the, the, the main, uh, thing I, I want, to, want, want to tell you, and, and maybe just to, to, to recapture what, what, what I've just, just uh, shown you and, and uh, emphasize the main conclusions. So, so first of all, okay, just want to emphasize that in, in this stage, I mean, we have made many simplifications in getting there, but still kind of now we have a concrete phase diagram for KVD QED. And if you now want to add corrections or other, other effects, okay, so this is at least our first starting point um, where you have a concrete set of phases for a given set of parameters. So what this also shows, you know, which, I, uh, which it was a question I raised in the beginning, is that uh, the, the, the presence of the single mode can indeed change the phases or the, the, the macroscopic properties of a macroscopic ensemble of dipoles. Okay, so you already see it here. If I go to this, this let's say this point, if I increase the, the coupling to cavity, I would undergo through, uh, would go through a ferro, uh, ferroelectric phase transition that is induced by this cavity mode. And this can be, to some extent, you know, this part here can be, uh, to a large extent, uh, for example, explained by this renormalization of the cavity frequency, which simply makes then this, these interactions more, more prominent. But this, at this stage, you know, it's, it's just a modification of already a phase that I already knew. But also what I emphasized in this last point is that there are also completely new type of, of, of states of matter, for example, this collective subradiant phase, which are not in this, in this formalism of regular phases in, in solids and, and spin systems, and that are genuine to this, uh, this KVD. Okay, so, and this of course now all sounds, sounds, sounds very cool. And the question is now, can we do it in experiments? Can, can we just uh, study all the systems? But here, you know, I just want, want to point out again that everything I describe here also where physics really gets interesting. So this really requires this very large interaction strength. So this is the single uh, dipole coupling must exceed the KV frequency. So in other words, you know, uh, to emphasize this. So, I mean, we have uh, electric, uh, um, you know, electric forces are, are, are weak. So we have to somehow cheat uh, nature by a factor of, of almost 137. In principle, it's possible, but you know, you should keep in mind that uh, arranging this in the setting in, in experiment will not be easy. It is, although uh, at least it is uh, possible in using this uh, already today, you know, using this analog system. So if you do an effective model in terms of superconducting qubits, couple of circuits, you can realize actually this type of physics already with today's te technology. So I think that's why it's also not uh, completely useless to talk about the systems. Okay, uh, with this, you know, I'm really running out of time. So in principle, there would be now more phases, uh, more complicated stuff, uh, also a little bit of thermodynamics that can heat up this, this system. Uh, again, see phase transitions, uh, specific heat, the changes uh, with coupling strain. We can look at black body radiation, but yeah, this now is a little bit too much. And I think I should really stop here. I've given you the kind of the main conclusions already in the previous slides. So let me just... Uh, Stop here. Thank you for attention. In particular, I highlight once more all the people that have been involved in this work that I just showed you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter.
uh, for this illuminating talk. This is a system we, we thought we know everything about up until today. Um, we have a, a, a few questions. Um, so one uh, relates to these terms, super radiant and sub radiant. Um, so how, how does um, it relates to super radiant and sub radiant if uh, uh, to begin with, um, there isn't actually any decay that was you know, included in the uh, model uh, explicitly. There is no decoherence and still what, what radiates. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is uh, is a little bit problem uh, about this term, uh, terminology. Uh, let me let's go back to this this thing. So, um, so usually, let's say that there are two ways uh, people talk about uh, super radiant and sub radiant. So one is kind of the, the decay super radiance. That's the the phenomena. You go to excited you go to excited state with many atoms, and they collectively start to radiate and radiate faster than, than individual atoms. And then there are also subradiant states. If you have uh, certain combinations of excited atoms, they will, via interference, uh, radiation is, is um, inhibited. Okay, so that's, that's, usually, that's this decay process, sub, superradiant and subradiant decay. So then uh, what people did with this, um, with this uh, decay model when they first uh, discussed about this phase transition in the ground state. Okay, let's say what, what I talk about here, super radiant is a state, is a ground state phase. Okay, so I'm talking about not excited atom. I have atoms, everything is ground state. And if I go back to the sticky model, people have shown that the ground state of the sticky model is such that there's a finite number of photons there or a field expectation value. And this is also, I mean, it's, it's uh, looking back, it was not a very good choice, but also this ground state is called super radiant. Okay, so it's, it's the ground state with a finite field expectation value. And this is simply what people call super radiant. Yeah? So nothing decays, nothing evolves. It's, it's a ground state phase. And uh, maybe, so, so once more, I mean, this, this is what people call if there's a finite field expectation value in, in this field, but it's all ground state, it's stationary, it just means that the atoms essentially are polarized. But historically, it's called super radiant. Thanks. Um, two, two questions kind of relate to the, um, to the you know, to multiple dipoles uh, and to the inhomogeneity uh, between them. Of course, in, mm. in real cavities, there would, there would be inhomogeneity of coupling to the mode. Um, also, maybe in, in the circuits, um, there, there would be. Um, uh, you know, even zero point motion, maybe. Um, so at the end, um, um, how how sensitive are these models and or those these results to uh, to inhomogeneous coupling, the entanglement? How much is it sensitive? Mm. So um, I mean, okay. So er everything I, I talked here is is about okay having this um, this coupling constant uh, the same. Um, in the end, it does not, okay, so actually in, in some of our original works, we actually looked at, uh, for example, putting a lot of disorder, so having different, uh, the coupling constants fluctuating by 30%, frequencies fluctuating by 50%, so in the end of the day, nothing, you know, because it smears out a little bit or so, but the, the main features uh, are still there, you know, even if you have quite a large amount of disorder. Mm -hmm. So this, so that's why it doesn't uh, change a lot. I mean, something that, that we are currently looking at, um, let's say this was always for, for one mode. If you now think about, okay, I have many modes, all of them have different wave uh, function profiles. So that, that, that was coupled to different modes with different profiles. Um, that's actually something we, we're looking at at the moment, but this is uh, at this stage, okay. Uh, tough problem because multi modes and multi dipoles and <laughs> no symmetries anymore. It's it's uh, it's just a mess. But on on the level where you can have a, a single mode, I mean, just changing a little bit all these parameters uh, is actually quite insensitive to, to all these things. Mm -hmm. We had one request in the chat. Uh, could you please name mathematical tools or packages you used for modeling and for the simulations? Um, the Let's say the first part. Um, so everything up to here, you can just do in uh, this is uh, MATLAB simulations, uh, Python simulations. These are all kind of end to eight. Um, 
eight to 10 spins. So this you can do because you're living in this, in this symmetric subspace. Okay, so, so every, let me just uh, point this out. So everything here is collective spin operators. So that's why the, the Hilbert space, I mean, you need to include quite a lot of number of photons because you yeah, couple them very strongly, but uh, this type of calculations, these simulations, you can do for 10 particles on a laptop in MATLAB, Python and so on. The, the final thing, okay, so this just also to, to emphasize here. So these, these simulations, now you have, have to include the full uh, spin system, the full Hilbert space, um, and you see here, uh, this is done up to something like 30 particles. Uh, you can do this and, and maybe a few hundred photons. Okay, it depends quite, quite a lot in which parameter regime you are. And this is now exact diagonalization. And here I have to, <laughs> cannot give you the answer. Uh, here I have to refer to, um, to, to Michael Schuller. So he was a PhD student also in the group of Andreas Leuchli. So they are a group that developed so they really had the state of the art of, of having exact diagonalization system uh, methods for spin systems. And so, so this is now really a C code running on a cluster. And I would say pretty much state of the art what you can do in terms of exact diagonalization methods. But for the details, you know, so this is more complicated. This is nothing I can, uh, someone has to talk to experts to, to do these simulations. Thanks. Um... One last question, could one build a quantum simulator for your model uh, that has the uh, fine balancing of the coupling baked in through some symmetry? So the, um, yeah, so, so if you want to do a, a simulator, of course, let's say if you do a, a real system, then, then this, yeah, this, this P squared term, this, this cancellation, you know, that, that comes out naturally and, and if you want to simulate it, you have to find new tune it, you know, otherwise you go to the other side. Um, so I think for a simulator, you will always need to do this tuning. Um, actually, we we have so far, um, I mean, we have looked at draft iron implementation to do a simulation of the systems. In principle, these type of interactions, we know collective spin squared interactions so also that this is possible. So what we in the end actually found uh, is that it's it's quite challenging. Okay, so if you do your model, but then you look at all corrections, you have to do a lot hierarchy of parameters. And if you arrive at the regime where the model is valid, you know you're really at a very low low coupling strains. Okay, so then you're in Hertz regime, and then um, it becomes challenging to do it with these te technology. So this is maybe also something I, I want to, to emphasize. I mean, we didn't look extensively on this, but at this stage, I would say there's not yet a very good quantum simulation scheme to do this now really for you know, 10, 20, or even more, more particles. So if there are creative minds out there, but it, it's, I, I think the challenge is, is that you have to, so you have to make the single coupling strong, and then you have this, this term here, this case like G squared. Okay, so if this is already big, this is even bigger. And then you usually couple to also uh, also all, all type of other excitations in your system if you do a, a realistic estimate. So I, I thought you know it would be straightforward to do a simulator with this, but actually it turns out it's, it's also <laughs> not only the model itself is challenging, but also the simulator. And nevertheless, can we still summarize that there is no no-go theorem? The I think in the end it's it's a little bit. Uh, more complicated. Um, one has to be, uh, yeah. So, so, so you know, so, so let's say if you restrict your no-go theorem to the, I mean, we don't have if you don't have any interactions in the system, we don't have the subradiant state. Okay, so if you call this a no-go theorem, is there a superradiant superradiant state? Then this would still this is still valid. Okay, at least mm -hmm. what we find here. Mm -hmm. Then I think it becomes a little bit more questionable if, if you now in system with, where there are already interaction, then of course you can in principle have this, this super radiant state and then one has to distinguish this separately. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But what, what you find, maybe to summarize, so I've shown you that this this, uh, this pair in the Coulomb gauge, this no goal theorem, goes, uh, I mean, it's not valid in principle. But if you then do the, 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 the same calculation in the dipole gauge, you still don't get. Uh, a super radiant phase. 
without embarrassment. Cool. All right. So um, uh, thank you again, Peter. And I hand over to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you also from my side, Peter, for a very cool and inspiring talk. Uh, I'd like to mention that we'll be back on February 3rd with another colloquium. And if you want to get notified about what we do, please go to our website at quantumscienceseminar.com. You can subscribe to our email list or Google Calendar. You can follow us on Twitter as well. And you should also, as always, check out our sister seminar, the Virtual AMO Seminar. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest. And we hope to see you again on February 3rd. Uh, same time, same place. Bye.